Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Gavin Strange, I'm a director and a designer uh, based here in Bristol in the UK. Hey gang, my name is James White and I am in Newcastle upon time, formerly of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and I go by Signal Noise, which is probably backwards to everybody. Hey, how are you? So thank you so much. Welcome to Hustle Mania Online. And the reason we're doing it online is, as you know, we're all pretty much self in self-isolation and in quarantine. And we wanted to do a little something live online to sort of bring what we love to do together, which is which is do combined talks to, to everyone. Um, we were due to be speaking at the OFF Festival in Barcelona, which would have been happening at the end of April. And OFF is a very, very special festival based in, in Barcelona. And, it's been, and it would have been the 20th anniversary uh, in April. It's been postponed, it's not been canceled, it's been postponed till the autumn. But OFF is a very, very special place. And me and James, were gonna do a combined talk called Hustle Mania. Um, it's the second time that we will have, uh, actually, third or fourth time we would have taken the stage together uh, but it would have been the second time that we would visit off and do our combined talk um uh, we love off but that's what we want to get into tonight we want to talk a little bit about our talking experiences our friendship um and and also just sort of hopefully provide some useful bits of information about public speaking and how useful that can be in anything from your school or your college or your job or, or whatever it may be. But um, I'll hand over to James because James is gonna, is gonna just uh, kick us off with a bit of his off history and story. Yeah, man. So uh, it's uh, like, yeah, I think we're dedicating this to, uh, to off. And, uh, and on behalf of both of us, like Hector and Natalie, we miss you both and we're wishing you all the best. Uh, with everything that's going down with uh, the conferences and some such. And I actually had another talk that was postponed over in Georgia in, in the United States, uh, the people at Creative South. So if anybody here is tuning in from Creative South, uh, hopefully I will see you very soon. And uh, all my best going out to, uh, to Mike Jones and Andrew and the whole crew. Uh, so Andrew is even here. What's up, Andrew? So off. Yeah, man, let's talk about off. Like, um, See, a little bit of the road actually leading up to Gav and I getting on stage together is uh, we are both Flickr kids from back in the day. And we started posting our, our artwork on and Flickr pools and that kind of thing. And I don't know if it was Gav that came across my work or I came across Gav's, but we ended up commenting back and forth. And, uh, and uh, as everybody knows, Gav is a, uh, a very optimistic and jovial fella doing lots of happy artwork and stuff. So I, we naturally gravitated to the same area. And despite doing very different work, we, we became friends on Flickr and then transferred over to Twitter and then ended up meeting at a talk in Aberdeen, Scotland for the first time at the Meet Conference. Our buddy, uh, our buddy Cam put that on. And uh, yeah, been, been the, the tag team ever since really. Um, but the, the Hustle Mania brand that we brought to the stage in, uh, at Off in Barcelona started as a joke and this is one thing everybody out there i'm going to give you guys a little bit of advice never joke with gav about doing something because he'll <laughs> like take off and by the end of breakfast he'll have like a demo reel cut <laughs> and everything else so you got to be careful so that's how it started like hey we should do a thing together and by that we had to after at the end of breakfast we had a logo and a name and then we were doing it a couple months later so uh yeah and that was that was the lead up to doing uh, to doing the big the big um, stage thing at off in Barcelona and that would have been 2016 is that right no 2017 17 yeah I think, I think. yeah 2017 yes yeah yeah, um, yeah and it's also kind of worth saying that actually I love the energy of when you have a stupid idea just run with it just see how far it can take you I think that's where the most exciting interesting stuff is because it's that giddy excited stage of it maybe shouldn't exist and it, you don't really know if it makes sense or it has a home, but that's when it just, like creativity just feels the best because you're like, oh, okay, oh, I'll, just, I'll just go with it. I'll just, just run with it. And me and James were having, having dinner together, uh, having breakfast together, sorry, just talking about we should do a combined talk because we've always, yeah, our work is very different, but our energy and our sort of stage performance is you know <laughs> dare i say because we we we've always said we're not educating anyone we if anything hopefully we we'll, we we want to entertain people um because we just talk about uh hot pink basically and, <laughs> and and not much else um but saying uh, 
I totally forgot to say right at the top before we go in this, and now everyone's joined us. Thank you so much for tuning in. So, some buddies of mine, a very good friend of mine at Sony and my friends at Media Molecule have kindly gifted me five uh, download codes for the PS4 video game slash creative tool, Dreams. If you haven't seen Dreams, it is, oh God, it's mind blowing how to explain it. It, it, it is like a, a, a creative tool on, on the PS4. You can make video games and art and sound and uh, animation and everything in between. And we have five codes to give away for free. So you'd be able to get the game and what better time to, you know, lose yourself in something creative than now. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to take questions from you guys at the end. So if you leave your questions below, and as we're, we're chatting, uh, at the end, we'll answer as many questions as we can. Thank you so much for, for sending them in. And then me and James will choose the best five and then we will send on a, uh, a PS4 Dreams code for you. So big shout out to Tim and Sony and Media Molecule for making something wonderful. Anyway, sorry, that was me. I totally forgot to uh, to say that. Where were we, James? We're talking about off, weren't we? Oh, we're talking about off, yeah. Like, so <clears throat> leading up, like, uh, let's continue on with what you, what uh, what that, that conversation was about how we ended up on stage together. Like, uh, what was actually let's uh, let's rewind it back actually let's talk about our our first like speaking experience like individually how did you how did you become interested like what like at what point in your career did you think like i got something to say or i want to try that or how did that work for you anyway well <laughs> well it was like for me it was a two two stage thing the first one is i never ever ever presumed i could be a speaker i never presumed that I would have anything worth saying. Um, I just, just didn't. It never, it never occurred to me. It really didn't. And it was a chance meeting with a, with a stranger called John uh, on a train in the Midlands where we ended up chatting because he was wearing an Apple T-shirt. And uh, Apple stores had not long opened in the UK. And I was a big Apple nerd at the time. And um, we just ended up chatting, 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 chatting away. I was a freelance designer at that point, working in the Midlands. And John uh, was was working at an Apple store, and then we just chatted, geeked out about all things technology and Apple, and then went our own way. And um, about a week later, I get an email from from this person saying, "Hello, I'm John. You met on the train. Um, I like your work. <laughs> Have you ever thought about giving a talk? Because I'm starting to do events here at Apple. Would you be interested?" And it was more just. I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know if I could do it, but I was so thrilled and honored that someone had asked. And I just didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to let them down because I thought that this opportunity might never ever come again. And um, I just said, yes, yes, of course, of course. And basically it was the worst talk I've ever given in my life. <laughs> I spoke for an hour and a half. The only people that came were my friends and family and bless them, they didn't sit down, they just, heard me speak for an hour and a half going and then i made this and then <laughs> next i made that i took everything i ever made ever honestly i laid it all out on the one of those big beautiful wooden benches in the apple store and proceeded yeah, yeah. to talk about every single bit i had no idea about timing or pacing or right. storytelling um so that was my first talk experience and then it was talking to you, James, actually. I think I'd spoken at a few different things then, because like anything, right, you put what you've done out into the world, and the more that you keep sharing it, people people see that and go, well, that is what they do. They don't know behind closed doors that maybe you're new to that, or maybe you're, you're really trying to steer your work and your career in that direction, but you don't know how. It's really about what was the last piece of work you did. And so I was sharing that I was doing talks and I was doing more and more, and I knew that you'd spoken at FITC, I knew that you'd spoken at OFF, um, and I really wanted to speak at those venues as well, because I'd gone as an attendee, and I kindly reached out to you, mate, and you were so kind in saying, yes, I'll give you a, a you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up with, um, with, the, with the guys, and you put me in contact, and, and I think from there on, I just, I just love it. It's a real honour, isn't it? It's a real privilege to be able yeah, to sure. stage and to talk about what you love, and to... And the more I do it, I really want to hopefully make it something useful. I want to make it um, something that people can take away from, even if that takeaway is this dude's an idiot, but I've been entertained for <laughs> five minutes, an hour. Whatever it is, if you take away something, then that's amazing. But how about you? How did you get into it? And then what, what sort of, yeah, what was the catalyst for going, I like this, I want to do more? Yeah, it was actually uh, the same link to FITC that you had. So, um, 
in 2009, I think it was 2009, like I had started to pick up a little bit of steam like online with my studio and, you know, just wanted to become part, like a bigger part of, or sorry, I wanted to be part of a bigger community. And I couldn't do that in my small hometown. So FITC was happening in Toronto. Shouts to, uh, to Jack and Sean and everybody. Um, and yeah, in, in 2009, I ended up going as an attendee. And I was actually sitting in, in the audience. And it was a, a combined seeing uh, our, our friend Brendan Dawes speak. And yeah, seeing, Brendan. Yeah, Brendan, man. And seeing Joshua Davis speak. And that's when I kind of had it in, like, in my head that, wondering if like can i do that do i have something to say do i have something to contribute and uh and then yeah going home and over the course of that next year or six months i guess trying to build my own talk on my own time and then reaching out to sean and asking him like hey are you looking for speakers for next year and he got back to me and uh and said like actually yeah come on up so he gave me a stage for the first time so sean pucknell gave me uh, uh roll the dice on me for better or for worse and uh and put me on a stage which was i mean it was fantastic and that was the same the same situation you were gav like i didn't know how to do it i didn't know the science behind it it's like it's sort of like stand-up comedy i hear like you only know how good the material is unless you get in front of people and present it right and that's how you know what's funny what's not what's informative what falls flat and the only way you do that is to torture yourself by being in front of people so i got i got to do the same thing went up and I, th I think it went okay, but I finished it and I was just like, God damn, I hope people like that thing. And, and the reception was, was okay. So, you know, but it was, it was, I didn't know what to, what to present. I didn't know how to, in what order to present it in. I was putting a bunch of like, these are my favorite artists kind of things in there. So like Drew Struzan stuff and like Goonies posters and crap. So I didn't know how to do it. And it was, it was good. And, and the team at FITC was super comforting. Like they really uh, made everything easy like everything surrounding the talk itself. So um, yeah, and in terms of the, the things I wanted to present or wanted to participate was, you know, you uh, when you go up on stage, you wanna have something of value to pass on to the audience. Like you said, even if it's just like, hey, that was a good time. Like you want something of value to be passed on. And, and that was all, that's always been in, in my peripheral. Like, yeah, I can present my work, but I want there to be a lesson. I want there to be a takeaway. I want the people in the audience to go home and be able to apply something that we were talking about to their own work and uh, further it or keep exploring or that kind of thing. So yeah, that's um, that's that's sort of my little story about how and how I got on stage. It's all Sean's fault. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. God bless you, Sean. I yeah, was, um, I wanted to share my first off memory. So. So I'm sure many people uh, who are kindly listening know, but um, off, yeah, it was this huge creative festival in Barcelona, 3,000 people. It's mad. The energy is, is, is insane. And I went in 2012, and I vividly remember this because there, there is a young man in our, who's, who's watching this, by, goes by the name of Frey Station, Josh Davis, the, <laughs> the grand granddad the the godfather the og of off and i'd never seen josh uh, speak before and i really didn't know what to expect i hadn't really seen i hadn't been to any big conferences or festivals and he blew me away i'd never heard someone talk so fast and use so many swear words in <laughs> such a small amount of time and it, i just i just remember almost having a uh, a uh, an out of body experience. I was like, what is happening to my senses? And I loved it. I loved it. And it was Josh who showed me about the different types of speaker you can be, much like the different kind of creative you can be about trying to find your voice. And the thing obviously about trying to find your voice is it's very difficult. It can take forever. Um, and it's all about having the confidence to sort of say things in the way that you want to say it and, and to not to not question yourself. But Josh was being just totally Josh. And he told this amazing story. And I'm sure Josh would all, all, all say who it is exactly in the comments. But he, he spoke about another speaker. Who was it? Who was really nervous and basically just spoke without showing any other slides. He was on slide one for sort of like 50 minutes. I then realized he had, um, he had, you know, 10 minutes to go through 100 slides and then just absolutely hammered through them. And Josh <laughs> did it as an example and absolutely hammered through 100 slides. As an example, the crowd was in tears with laughter. And I was just amazed at this. It was a performance. It was a show. It was a, 
Yeah, Chuck Anderson, no pattern, that's it. Thank you, Josh, and, and bless you, Josh, you absolute legend of a human, Prey Station for life. Um, yeah, he told this 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 story about about uh, no pattern, Chuck Anderson, and it just blew me away. Yes, it, um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was bonkers, and so that was a real a real eye opener for me, and I just sort of came up, came away a different human nice. from it. Um, and th and that w that sort of set the scene, you know, the fact that that was eight years ago, and that is firmly lodged in my memory. It was a, it was a, yeah, it changed the way I perceived it. How you could could be a speaker, and it and it it really made me feel like, oh, I won't say anything new, but maybe I could entertain. Maybe I could be an exaggerated, uh, uh, an exaggerated sort of caricature of who I am on stage because it's it's freeing, it's liberating. I think that's a really really nice thing about it. How about yeah. you, man? What was your what was your sort of key prime or first off experience? First off experience, man, it was uh it was scary. Like the first time I spoke there, it was in it wasn't in the big area, it was in like the smaller room. And I remember being super intimidated because uh Justin Maller was there that same year. And Justin at the time, I don't know if I've ever told him about this, but Justin was like, I was a huge fan of Justin Maller because he was there back in the early web days, the same as Josh, but uh, it was, it was, I think he was in the audience to see me speak. And that was terrifying me. So I'm like, that's, that's Justin Maller, you know? And he was doing a talk there that year too. Uh, but it was a, it was a surreal experience being on stage there because it was the first time that I've been off North American soil to do a talk. So that was a whole other thing because, you know, I can, I can goof around with a bunch of Canadians and that's fine. But if I go over to like another country, it's like, are any of my jokes even gonna like work? Do they even know who Scooby-Doo is? Like, I had no idea. So it was, uh, that was pretty terrifying, but it was ultimately like the best experience because I mean, that's why off is so great anyway, because every year after that, it's, it always feels like a reunion. You know, it feels like it's the same people that go there and it's just uh, everybody knows each other and everybody's there just to have a great time, you know. And in the early days of speaking, especially at OFF, it, did, it doesn't feel like a conference. It doesn't feel like a, a, design, a design con or convention or whatever. It feels like an arts like celebration, a festival. And it was the first time that I really got an inkling that like we, we work in, in solitary uh, in solitary situations as designers and artists, right? So it normally it's just clicking away on, on Illustrator and Photoshop and it is super not glamorous, but you go to something like off and you see people on stage with these big shows and, and even if they're just, they design things that don't move, they can still, they still have this like presentation, you know, it's like going to a rock show, but without, without the rock and roll, it's just replaced with like vectors, which is awesome. And you know, it's for, it's for people like us and it's, it's uh, presented by people like us. And it's the first time that I got uh, an inkling that like what you said earlier about being an exaggerated version of yourself. Mm. And that's what we see people doing on stage all the time. It's just this, this heightened or maybe it's not exaggerated. It's just more specific, right? It's a more specific version of themselves and presenting stuff that we care about in a way that feels like a rock show, you know, like yes. that's awesome. And I, I never even thought that was possible clicking away uh, at Illustrator and Photoshop, right? So it's awesome. I think, like, I think that's what we love about Hustlemania, right? So, so uh, Hustlemania is purposely over the top. It's bombastic. It's called Hustlemania because it's obviously just a ripoff of WrestleMania, <laughs> which we're both massively influenced growing up by, because I think for me, being uh, English and watching uh, this this mad North American show, it was all about pomposity. It was ridiculous, and everyone had entrance music. Everyone <laughs> had a theme. Everyone had a costume. So that's why we wore those matching jackets. That's why we had introduction music. Oh, you know, we, yes, exactly. We're we're totally aware of how ridiculous it is. And it just felt like in these trying times, even when we did it in 2017, obviously the world's got progressively tougher. It just felt like we kind of just wanted it to just be silly and just have fun. And of course that is, we are, we literally just move vector points around or we push people <laughs> or what we do is not glamorous in the slightest at all, but for, for 45 minutes or for, for WrestleMania one, we had two hours, God bless you off. 
<laughs> and God bless you, our audience, for sticking with us. For you know, tolerating us for that long. <laughs> we had that time to to just be silly and, and I think that's what this is why we're doing this, right? We just, kind of just want to. It's lovely getting lost in the world of creativity and silliness and bright lights and you know things like off with the sound system. Oh my days! If you go, if you go just for the screens and the sound system, the bass is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really over the top we obviously had some great friends Flo and bloody chrome uh, make some amazing visuals for us on the first show um you know and, and just just be silly and we had josh um and jessica hish be our sort of celebrity guest <laughs> intruders halfway through the show and i love that i think people were like what what's happening now we've yeah. got the world famous creative geniuses storming the stage with confetti cannons and chairs <laughs> <laughs> so good dude yeah and that was another worry was like is wrestling even a thing in spain like we didn't friggin' know man so it's just like we're gonna have like people running on stage and they have entrance music or whatever making it big and loud and it yeah it went off and it was hilarious like i had a great time like just wandering around with a fold-up metal chair like i don't know we need more wrestling and design i guess <laughs> that's a takeaway for tonight if it's anything <laughs> We just need more wrestling, guys. We need WWE. Yeah, um, that's right, man. Uh, yeah. I think I totally forgot what I was going to ask you there. So, so obviously, with with us not doing our talk yet, so we're going to be doing it in in autumn in September when off is rescheduled. Um, what's your what is your talk about, James? What's your sort of your new topic? Because we both um, write saying this every year or two. We both sort of rewrite. Yeah, a brand new talk, and and I have for twenty twenty. I've written something brand new from new experiences, new work, new all of this stuff. How about you? What's yeah. what's yours about? Yeah, it's going to have a lot of new new work and new stories and that kind of thing. But there's going to be an, an underlying like uh, current under everything that I'm talking about. And I've done a lot of thinking about this, as you have too, about you know the philosophy of of what we do and why we do what we do and how we can manage to do what we do. And uh, yeah, my talk is going to be about, it's, it's nothing profound. It's going to be about time. Everything that we do revolves around time, whether it's uh, client work trying to hit a deadline, but also the amount of self-investment that you put in ultimately influence your skill level and your experience and your, um, your reaching goals and that kind of thing. And it's all just time. And, you know, it's, we like we get asked a lot by younger designers like what's what's the secret recipe to finding your creative voice or getting recognized online and all that stuff it's time it's all just time like there's no real shortcuts when it comes to s sitting down and getting the work done for the merit of improving your skill level or improving the the number of things that you're good at or pursuing that path to get from point a point point b point c um, so yeah, my talk is going to be, it's going to be all about the philosophy of just time. It's all just time and you have to respect that. You have to respect how much of it you have when you're young and you have to respect how little of it you feel like you have the older you get, you know, and it's a constant thing and it, it is like the, the ultimate force in the universe, you know, it's the only, the only thing we can't really mess with uh is, is time we just have to abide by it and respect it and make the most uh, out of it as we can so it's going to be about that and it's going to be a lot of stories told through that through that lineage and it's going to wrap into my youtube channel and the signal noise archive that's behind me and the zine that i'm doing and trying to tell tell my story through the years basically like i have an unbroken creative line of drawings and stuff going back to 1988 that's time. Like, there's the reason I do what I do. It's right there. And, you know, it's going to be all about time, man. But that's, I mean, that's, that is one of the only things that you're in control of, right? Because that's, that's one of those things where it, it can get so overwhelming with how do I get where I want to in my career? How do I grow this sector or grow this skill set? Or the only thing you kind of really are in control of is your time and where you allocate it and where you allocate your energy to it. But at the same time, because your parameters are locked, there is only this certain amount of hours, weeks, days, months, etc. You're kind of forced within those constraints. So I think that that's that's all you can do. And Josh said it there in the comments: is you've just got to make the work. You've just got to put in the time. Because actually, what you said there about you know maybe growing how many followers you have, how many people see it, and something I was looking at earlier, which is really interesting, 
is you know you for example james you've got a really big following on on insta and that's awesome because when you look at your feed for example just using this as an example you know you can tell your style of work you can tell your voice very easily very quickly and people go oh, i want that i want to be a part of that whereas someone like me i've always been a bit bitty i like different mediums i like different disciplines i'm a director one minute i'm a designer another so so I'm, I'm a bit fractured and that means that i don't really have um, a, a coherent voice um, so I don't I mean that's one of the factors why I don't have a, a large following online but but my point is I can't control that there's nothing I can do about that and of, of course we'd all like to to, to, to for, it, for our audience to be larger and for all that but it's not about that you've got to just go well I don't I can't concentrate on that I've just got to concentrate on making stuff making stuff that I want to believe in and you know and, and and for me that personally that might not mean that um it, it changes anything about an audience but it's I, that doesn't matter that'd be nice of course <laughs> let's be real everyone of course would like to be um to, to, to have their work seen by many people but yeah. um, that, that can't be the end goal if you've just got to all you can control is your time then you've kind of got to go well i'll make something else you know or or if i yeah. want to go into an area and I don't have it in my portfolio, I make the thing to put it in your portfolio. It doesn't matter if it's a bit wonky, doesn't matter if it's not perfect, doesn't matter, doesn't matter anything. Just make it and then make it better and then make it again and then yeah, do it yeah. all over again, you know. See, the, here's, the, here's the thing, like I'll, I'll challenge you on one point that you said, you, you do have a voice throughout all of your work. You do a lot of different kinds of work. Naomi and I were just talking about, uh, my wife Naomi, uh, we were just talking about this a little while ago, how your projects always look like Gav projects. Mm. They always have that. And I think it's like, um, you know, when, when it comes to your own work, you can't really, you're too close to it, so you can't right. recognize. So you see that as like, that's very different from this, that's very different from this, but it all feels like Gav projects. You know, well, so it's all Jam Factory. So that's, that's how I see it. Well, that's, I mean, mate, that's really kind of you to say. And funny enough, that kind of leads into what my talk is about oh, for yeah. this year and actually yeah i think i misused the wrong words i think i think i do have a voice and i feel like i'm after 20 years of working i'm discovering what my voice is i don't have a style but i do have a voice sure and, yeah, yeah. and i'm 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 only just learning the difference between them two because the sort of guiding founding principle for my talk this year is is and i say it i don't know whether this is true but i believe that this is true <laughs> is find your voice and your audience will find you and I think that's just come from 20 years of thinking about it and, uh, and, and thinking, well, yeah, okay, I don't have an aesthetic style per se. I use pink a lot, probably too much. <laughs> but um, you could argue that that's a style. Uh, and I guess I have a, coher a common thread. I, I, you know, but I also love many different disciplines, as we all do, and I want to play um, in, in, in different, different spaces. But maybe it hangs together. If I can cultivate anything, it's a voice. And I think my voice is I want to make things that are warm and friendly and charming and entertaining, a little bit silly. But um, a project I recently finished this film for Greenpeace, I want to use charm and warmth, but also tell a powerful, serious story. So, so again, it's sort of like, oh, that is my voice, actually. You know, and, and again, finding the confidence in both your your um personal work and then how that bleeds into your commercial work or it might all be the same or you might yeah. be just starting your career or you might be changing your career but yeah i think that that whole the whole thing of trying to find your voice it also feels like a lifelong pursuit oh yeah 100 percent, man yeah that never ends and you know you might find you might stumble upon a style that works for you at any given point in time but that's going to morph because and that's not like a uh an intentional thing for a lot of artists it's like just out of sheer interest you know, you build on one thing and then you build the next thing and then the next thing. And, it, you know, 10 steps later, wh where you're at creatively doesn't look like what it did back there. So, yeah, and it's just all about interest. Um, yeah. And, and time, man, yeah, that's that's yeah. what it is. Um, yeah. Let's bring it back to that. I have a question about your Greenpeace, um, your Greenpeace project. When you I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this or I may be putting you on the spot. <laughs> but when you were like you came up with the, the story idea and you co-wrote it. With, uh, with some people at Ardman. Did you pitch a number of ideas for that or were you one of many people that pitched ideas for it? So that was your singular pitch idea. Yes, yeah, so, so, so Ardman and Greenpeace uh, began the relationship of wanting to work together, which was just amazing in itself. Everyone was just like really hyped and stoked that that was happening. 
And yeah, lots of directors pitched their different ideas. And I had my idea, my idea, the seed of my idea was called loss because it was about loss of many different things. It was the loss of a family member. It's the loss of a habitat. It's the loss of a home. It's the loss of a way of life. It felt like it sort of encompassed everything that I wanted to try and tell in the story. So that was my initial proposal um, that like all ideas, you know, it was the seed of the idea. And then as we went, as we continue, and I was lucky enough to be chosen for that, to develop that, we developed it further and we, we refined it with Greenpeace to obviously it's telling a, hopefully telling a funny emotional story, but also it needed to do everything that Greenpeace needed it to do as well and, and tell a powerful, impactful message. And I sort of, that was my story, but then I worked with an incredible writer called Sam Morrison who wrote it, who brought it to, to, to life with the words, you know, it's taking the story. There's one thing creating the story and then it's, it's creating the script and creating the words. And then Sam is so lovely that it was a real collaborative effort. So he, he, he would do a draft and I would take it on and then I would noodle and just because we were really trying to make it very naturalistic and very casual because it's about a family, uh, a, a family of turtles uh, on their journey home. I wanted it to be authentic because everyone's been stuck in a, in a vehicle with your family on a long journey home. Everyone talks over each other. Everyone doesn't wait for anyone to finish speaking. So we were, we made sure we put lots of that sort of natural, natural stuff in. So, so, you know, for me, collaboration on that was, was, and that was the biggest collaboration uh, in my career, career so far with so many yeah. people and so many incredible people. So, yeah. you know, that was, that was really eye opening. We're, we're obviously talking about being individuals, but, and this, kind of comes back to the reason we're talking about public speaking right because um i think it can help in any facet of life especially creative life even if you are just trying to sell your idea to some to another individual to try and get someone on board so if you can just you know take anything away from what those two idiots are talking about you know and <laughs> try to just have confidence in your own voice that that will always help you whether you're standing up in front of your classmates or your teachers or your your boss um I think I think you know speaking can be a great help. You don't have to, you don't have to be an extrovert to be a speaker. I think yeah. that's really important to to do. And again, that's about finding your own voice. It's about finding your way to communicate. Um, yeah. But if you can just have that little little boost of confidence to go, no, I am. What I say is valid. I'm going to contribute yeah. it. Um, yeah. And before we go any further, because it's halfway, uh, roughly halfway through, I just wanted to give a reminder to everyone that please do leave us any. Um, any questions we've kindly got five uh, ps4 download codes for the video game slash creative tool dreams kindly thanks to sony and media molecule and we will pick the best five questions at the end and we will send them some codes uh, and also massive thank you to everyone leaving lovely comments i know we're not replying to them yet because we're we're too busy geeking out but we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll scroll all back and catch up but thank yeah, you for yeah. again. thank you for listening anyway yeah. continue oh. Yeah. What were we saying? What were we saying? Uh, about, <laughs> uh, you know, speaking and just how that can be, I think, a useful tool for right. anyone, really. Even, even if it's maybe convincing yourself, you know, like when you're in your own brain. <laughs> yeah, like that's the thing. Like, um, that's one of the things, a big takeaway that I had by getting on a stage is that leading up to it and preparing a talk, you have to do so much self-analysis. And that's something that, you know, I don't know about you, Gab, but that's something that I haven't done up until that point. So having to think back and like, look at the work that you've done, but then trying to figure out, like, not only how you did it, but why you did it a certain way and thinking about all of those little decisions you make along the way when you're making one piece of art, and then looking at your body of work and trying to figure out the decisions, the broad decisions of what led you to do this and then this and then this and then this. Now, I'm a big fan these days of self analysis when it comes to artistic progression and recognizing the things that work and the things that don't work throughout your career. Because I feel like every so often creatives have to look back and sort of consolidate the things that they enjoyed and the things that they felt work and the things that they learned and bring all those things together to move to like the next level of what they're doing. And sometimes that's a conscious decision. Sometimes it's not, but this consolidation of of work could be in the form of an art book, for example, like bringing everything together. For me, it's the, the damn zine that I'm doing and it's the YouTube channel. I'm trying to consolidate a lot of things that I learned and the things that I enjoyed into one product. And I feel like with, with style and with voice and what have you, like that is something that artists tend to do along the way that 
you know, things that we don't enjoy just kind of get shaken off and we just keep pro progressing and pursuing those things that we do enjoy. And those that, like you could say that's the, the level upping or whatever, but that consolidation of, of skills is something that's, I'm super interested in and looking back, you know, what, the further into your career you get, you have the luxury of looking back and seeing your path and how it, how it progressed from one thing to the other. And, you know, I'm, I've never been one to be embarrassed by past work. You know, it's all of the work that we do for better or worse in our past is a perfect snapshot of where we were at that given time. And that's admirable and it's adorable. And you, know, you could look back and go like, oh, look at that kid. Look what he was <laughs> trying to do, you know, and who he was aping at the time or whatever. Like, I love that stuff. And I think a lot of artists, in order to, you know, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. So looking back at that stuff and trace connecting those dots is something that I'm a big fan of. And I think that creative people should always do that. Like always analyze what you did a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, even if that goes right back to when you were 10 years old, you know, what, what were you exploring back then? Could that be brought into your career now? That magic, you know, now Gav, I know like, and through Sullivan, of course, like you have a, 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 a childlike enthusiasm for your work and you you, you always try to, to put that into your work so it was is that inherently built into you or is that something that you had to consciously try to fight through if you had an angsty teenage year or whatever <laughs> um funny enough i was thinking about that today because now i think i've always had it i get this real like frizzy energy in my tummy when about <laughs> just making stuff <laughs> and creating and I think it's just got more intense as I've got older because I didn't have the confidence I didn't have um the self-belief I didn't have the self-esteem that I could make anything of any worth and I still might not make anything of any worth but I've stopped caring whether that matters I've stopped letting that stop me if you see what I mean yeah. and yeah I just get a real fizzy fizzy feeling for oh I could make that oh I could do that oh I could just create you know just just make stuff um and i think i I've, I've just noticed that and i've just always felt that there's never a downside to that there's not sort of a, a flip side to that feeling that i indulge the the urge to make something and then i i come away going oh you know no not at all just I just just love it i just love the excited feeling and and i'm i'm very fortunate that i feel like i've been rewarded for that you know i've got a dream job i've worked in some dream projects god bless them um and and hopefully if anything i've been enthusiastic and i think that's the other thing as well you know like we were saying with our talks if anything we want people to be entertained and mm. i think god if, if, at the very least if people have have hated meeting me or hated working with me hopefully you know they feel like uh, at least they go god he's an idiot but he's enthusiastic you know? <laughs> maybe that's on my gravestone just here lies gavin strange he was enthusiastic <laughs> I mean, ellipses before it. He was enthusiastic. Like, and I, that and with an exclamation mark. I massively overused exclamation marks. It'd be Gavin Strange, exclamation mark. He's dead, exclamation mark. <laughs> he was enthusiastic. And then a shrug emoji. Oh, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, awesome. How about you? How about you? I mean, I know, obviously, your childhood and your upbringing is a huge part of your um, your talks and always, and always has been. But has it just been a natural... Do you have down days? Because you're such a positive person and you're also Canadian, so everything always seems like it's really positive. <laughs> Do you, I can't imagine you being down, being fed up. I can imagine you being frustrated. I know that you're a perfectionist and I know that you want to get things right. Yeah. But are you, yeah, I can't imagine you just being like, oh, do you know what? Screw it. I can't bother. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine that's you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm human and I have the, like, you know, artists are cant cantankerous folk. And, you know, I have those days too. If you ask Naomi that, I mean, she would tell you, yeah, he gets frustrated. Um, it's not often. Um, normally the creative process is pretty smooth for me. And if things aren't going the way that I want them to within the process, I know that I could just back up a couple of steps and then correct it and then get on the right path again. But yeah, I have my, my frustration moments too. And it's, uh, you know, I don't believe in things like, creative block or any of that stuff and you know and i know that's a debatable topic or whatever but i never i've never suffered from that like the fear of the blank 
canvas like that's such nonsense like i don't that's the kind of thing that it's people worry about it because somebody put it in their head so then they get anxious about like oh no what if it's creative block what do i do and you're just getting distracted by the notion of creative block instead of just it's what you do you just sit down and you run through your process it's it's trial and error it's uh, you know concepting whatever so yeah i get i get frustrated like anybody else and it's mostly it mostly comes from lack of planning you know if i don't nail things down in my sketchbook properly ahead of getting into Photoshop or Illustrator, I'll inevitably run into problems. That's just how it goes. And it happens every time. So I'll start doing something, get super frustrated and then go like, why isn't this working? Like, because I didn't sketch the damn thing out yet. Like sketch it out, do the planning, then move into, into Photoshop or Illustrator and then do that. You know, that's a Photoshop and Illustrator are great software, but they're tools. You know, um, the idea needs to come from up here. It can't come from Photoshop or Illustrator, you know? So you just got to sit down and plan it out. So I get frustrated like anybody else. Normally I just go for a walk or something or uh, Naomi makes me a tea. <laughs> and uh, you and, uh, I guess that's sweet. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, man, I get, I get frustrated like anybody else. And I think that it's, it's just part of being an artist, you know? Like that stuff can't come together all the time all, yeah, like all the time, every time. So, you know, you just got to work through it. It's uh, it's one of those things, one of those process. Do you, like, have you ever hit like that sort of like, are you ever sitting at your desk at Ardman going like, ah, I can't get it out or whatever. Like that's a oh poor choice God. of words. All the time. For the first 10 years in Ardman, I was famous for just being really grumpy when I was, I mean, really? really high and really positive or if I can't do it and I don't have the ideas, oh my God days oh i'm awful <laughs> i'm an awful human being i'm just super grumpy and i get really mad and oh i used to be before i worked at arm when i was young in my career i was famous for smashing up keyboards and stuff i was just get yeah my friend johnny i don't know if johnny's here yeah the amount of keyboards and mouse uh mice i would go through because i would honestly i would just i just snap them in two and i would just I would, I just, because I love it so much when I can't do it, which is very frequently. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh, honestly. Oh my days. There was one time, what did we do? I think I couldn't, something went wrong. Johnny was at my house. I can't, something went wrong and I basically ended up smashing my keyboard until every single key was dislodged and it was terribly <laughs> useless and i know as soon as i snap as soon as i just start smack it's not it's never with people it's always inanimate objects <laughs> and computers man oh it's because they taunt you they taunt you right um, yeah oh yeah so yeah so i get super frustrated i'm a lot better now i'm a lot more again i recognize the process i go oh you're getting angry you're getting frustrated take a minute Go and look at something else. Go and do something else. Come back to the process. I sort of recognise the pattern right. for. Um, I recognise the pattern for frustration, and um, I try and avoid it. Um, right. So, Mr. White, I see it's nine forty-five. I reckon what we should do is, if it's okay with you, let's scroll back through the comments and let's try and answer every single one, but quite quickly, so we don't leave anyone out. Let's just try and smash all of them. Oh, um, all right. Uh, so, shall I do the scrolling? You're good. I can do scrolling too, but uh, are you scrolling right back to the beginning? Okay, uh, let's, okay. Should we go from the reverse? So we'll okay. go from what we've got now. Yeah, sure, man. I will start with the first question, then we'll take it in turns. All right. Have either of you used the Affinity apps? This is from John W. Have either of you used the Affinity apps, favorite three creative apps, and why? I will go first then. Yes, I have. Affinity, shout out Affinity. They're great. I need to use them more personally. I need to put more time into them, but they're smooth and they're stable, and I love them. You know, Adobe is an Adobe. Uh, favorite three creative apps on why for me, Ableton Live, because it's bomb proof and it's fun. It's great. Um, uh, Cinema 4D, because it's just a world of possibility. Uh, Illustrator, that's for me. Right. Well, you're just showing off because I only got two. So uh, I'm Illustrator of Photoshop, almost primarily. And then I use like the peripherals, like uh, uh, InDesign, and uh, I'm just dabbling in After Effects and Premiere for the YouTube channel, and I'm, I'm a super, super rookie at those things. And uh, yeah, I rock iMovie for my editing, man. I am, yeah, technologically savvy over here. <laughs> nice. So, All right, on to the next one. Do you want to do the next one? Yeah, I'm going to try. Okay, I got, a, I got a question here from Official Ridley, and it looks like uh, it might be one for you. Uh, question for you both. Chances of a post-CV19 audio-visual gig-slash-jam 
with Gab's Toy Project and collaborative live visuals from you both. <laughs> Just, Let's go, Gary. 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 Yeah, my boy. Yeah, let's definitely do that, Adrian. Thanks for the question. Uh, yes, we should do more visual stuff. I personally am trying to do more visual uh, audio stuff with this and just trying to make my talks a bit more ridiculous and silly. Uh, the Thecla, uh, James, uh, is a venue in Bristol and it's a boat. It's a boat that's also a gig venue. Me and Bingo did a talk on it a few years ago. Oh, nice. um, so we should definitely do Hustlemania there because it's awesome. Yeah, that's dope, right on. Um, yeah, cool. And also uh, in terms of live visuals and stuff, uh, my stuff doesn't move. It just sits there and does nothing. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we can make it move. We have the power. We have the power. Uh, Reviver Knight, thank you for the question. Which of your passion projects are you most proud of and why? For me, quickly, I probably would say, oh my God, passion projects. Oh, Bikes Mind. It was a film um, that I made with a big group of people, uh, a film about riding foot skid bicycles in Bristol, and it just transformed from a tiny short film into a half hour documentary with graphic design and illustration and animation and um, we had premieres around the world and uh, we had big bike events and it turned into a, and then a bike race, which then got shut down the bike with the police. It was a whole thing. So <laughs> bike time for me. How about you, James? Yeah, dude. I remember when you were doing that on Flickr because I remember seeing the logo come up and you had like vision, like your trailer and stuff. And I was yeah. like, what the hell is he into now? What's he doing? <laughs> so like he's, he's making a bike movie. Was this before uh, Fixed and Chips or after? after fixed and chips came because of the bikes mind sort of family of people that came together of which official ridley was a big part of um right. yeah and, and lots of people came together and it just got ridiculous and big best kind of passion project start small and let it just sprawl into the ether and go mental yeah yeah P passion projects mine right there my off the grid zines and this is something i'm doing right now and it's my my favorite passion project because it brings all of my passion projects together into one thing and I'm writing an art book without writing an art book. I'm releasing it in issues like a comic book. So this thing incorporates in the collectability. It's my artwork. It gives everything a home. And it's, uh, it's the most fun I've ever had doing a, a passion project. It's this little, uh, this little zine. So that's mine. And it's happening right now. Go and support James. Go and buy. Go to his website. Go to signalnoise.com. Find his zine. Buy them. Keep us all in a, uh, in a, in a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Keep us all on the job. <laughs> um, do you want to read the next question from the the Gwilin? I got it. The Gwilin, as you said, uh, as you said that style changes with your interests over time. How do you view the choice of taking the feedback of followers over working on changing style? How do you how do you view the choice? How do you view the choice of taking the feedback of followers over working on changing style? I think I understand that. Um, I, I don't, mm, that's a hard one, man. I kind of don't, um, man, I never tend to, to ask for feedback online on many things. And it's not because I don't want feedback. It's mostly because I kind of have a vision of what I want already in my head. And it's, uh, it's not that it, it will change. Okay, let me, okay, I'm, I'm screwing this up, Gav. Let me, let me rewind a second. I'm going to use Naomi, my wife, as an example. Um, Naomi is great at spotting things in my art that are in my blind spot, things that I haven't considered. So those sorts of things don't really have a change over style, per se, but it definitely makes the individual piece more effective. So I'm definitely up for, for taking feedback from, from people in that, in that light to make sure the individual thing uh, is better than what I had in my head. A better execution, I guess. I hope that answers the question. I really messed that up. Yes. Uh, I don't like uh, getting feedback or asking for feedback because it means I've got to change stuff and <laughs> I don't have time to change stuff because we only have a couple of hours in the evening. So I don't ask for it. And then it just means I can just get on. <laughs> hey, also, I'm really scared of feedback because it will find out that people go, well, that's terrible. No, generally in my in my own time, I just I just like to focus on just getting it done, and rather than ask for feedback and make something perfect, I make it again or make something new. Um, and also, I don't think I personally I have the audience that, that that's big enough to give that sort of feedback. Um, I think it's quite sweet. People are just either very supportive or don't say anything, which is the ideal situation. <laughs> for me. 
Um, but also my ego is so fragile that if I did have feedback, I'd just cry and obsess over it for a week. So, uh, right. so I try and avoid it. Right. Thank you for the question. Uh, Ollie Hooper says, now we're all trying to do our best and staying in. What are you guys planning to do with that time? Tutorials, personal projects, etc." Um, I know James has one with his YouTube channel. My YouTube channel. Yep, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make as much content for that thing as I can. And now that I have time at home, because this is where I do all my shooting, is in this room in front of the archives. So, yeah, I'm just exploring different topics. I'm diving into the archive and pulling things out and seeing, would this make a good episode or a good video? So that's what I'm doing. Yeah, YouTube. Nice. Um, I'm the same. I really like using Instagram Live, actually, because it's it's free and it's cheap and it's easy and it's instant. Um in light of that we won't be doing any talks for for what is a very long time yeah. um yeah i mean i know me and james would like to do this we'd like to do hustle Mania online um hopefully weekly you know if people are, are up for it and just kind of carry on talking about topics so yeah just trying to actually use the tools that we all use every day to hopefully just still connect with people and make stuff and entertain and 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 hopefully um, just give people a bit of distraction from the world for a bit. So, yes, yeah. thanks for the question, Ollie. Yeah, absolutely. I got one from Zombie Media. Uh, here's a quick question. Will this be able to be streamed at a later date? Thinking that this could be uh, really inspiring to some of my creative media students. Hey, that's awesome. Uh, They're facing a difficult time. Yeah, totally understand. These are the sorts of things like um, we we can save this onto our highlights. Is that right, Gav? I think you said yeah. that. I think yeah. so. So I think when we end this, we both get the chance to save it, and then you can save it and add it to your in your stories. Then I think we can highlight the story, keep it in our highlights, and then I think it's right. there. So that's a plan because I think yeah, we'd like to build up a, a bank of these, wouldn't we? Just if they are useful to people or, yeah. or people uh, uh, didn't get the chance to tune in tonight, then yes, we would definitely like for them to yeah live on, wouldn't we? So yes, absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Zombie Media. Wish your uh, students all the best from us. Yeah, good luck. Got yeah. speed. Uh, another question from John W. As artist, which company uh, had the best project to work with, and why did it push the buttons for you? So I guess what was the best sort of company or people you've worked with, and why was it so good? Uh, for me personally, uh, Greenpeace. You know, it's such a special, unique, formative, um, beautiful. Uh, once in a lifetime opportunity, and I will never ever forget it in my whole life. Yeah, no kidding. Mine is definitely Ubisoft, Far Cry yes. 3 Blood Dragon, because it uh, was it came to me at a perfect time, at a perfect point in my career, and that thing, um, it thrust me in front of the right audience at the right time, and it was with the right people. My buddy Dean Evans over at Ubisoft, formerly of Ubisoft, uh, came to me with that project, and it was uh, the best thing I ever worked on, the most fun, and his feedback was uh, more effing lightning. So, yeah, that was number one. Best client feedback ever. Right, we better we yeah. better speed this up before we're gonna get them all in. All oh, right, yeah, we got big big kilogram. Does planning talks help focus you on creating work to show, or does it at times get in the way of uh, get in the way of time to make work? It takes a long time to write a talk. It took yeah. me about a month, I think, full full time in my own time. So you know, between the hours of nine p.m. and eleven twelve p.m. for a whole month, and then all of the time I was at F FITC in Amsterdam recently, which was when I first did this new talk. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does take a long time, but then you've got it. And then every time you give a talk, you refine and you tweak. Uh, and, and so, yeah, but it yeah. does take time, but it's worth it, I think. How about you, yeah. James? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think the, uh, yeah, what you're asking about, uh, <laughs> you focus on work, uh, creating work to show. Sort of, yeah. And it's, it's made me better document my work over time. So if I know that I'm going to be presenting it on stage, I'll keep all of those previous versions and I'll keep them saved out and whatever. So that way, if I'm showing something on, on stage, it won't be just a still image and say, hey, I made this thing. It'll be, hey, I made this thing and here's how I went about it. And here was the story and the creative lineage that it took. So documenting work is definitely something that, that getting on stage has taught me to do um, adamantly over the years. So yeah, definitely. Nice. Next one. Yeah. Oh, you want me to read this one? Yeah, go on then. No, okay. Carolyn, hey, uh, what are your thoughts on the current situation and how will it impact the creative industries? Any suggestions or freelancers? Oof. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's but... real, isn't it? I mean, we, we could, we, 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 are, we could spend three hours talking, we could spend forever talking about this. For me, in short, I'm, 
I have no idea what happens next. I really don't know. Yeah. This is unprecedented. And I think all we can do is be supportive to each other, hang out, give notes, give tips, give anything, just be collaborative and fun and try and find the headspace to make stuff and create stuff, do whatever makes you happy. But, yeah. you know, just all go through this together and just, just be kind. Yeah, and it's a, you're absolutely right, man. It's all, it's all about supporting one another and doing things like this. I mean, when me and Gav were talking about this a couple of days ago, that is the exact reason we wanted to do this because number one, we want to hang out with people. And number two, we want to give a space for other people to come and hang out as well. So seeing everybody talk back and forth in the, in the chat room, you know, when most of us are, are at home, you know, in isolation, not going to work or whatever, and like we need, we need community now more than ever, you know, and it's uh, like, we're all, we're all in vastly different situations. We all have like some people are with agencies, some people are, are freelance and you know, that's, that's the description of me and Gav right here and agencies have different impacts than freelance does. So we're all, we're all going through something on some level. So, you know, we just got to kind of link our arms and, and, and brace, you know, and, uh, and, and hope this stuff blows over. Use, use our time. Here, 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 here. Um, Lovely comments from David and Prey Station. Thank you. God bless you. Question from Flo. Hello, Flo. Uh, do you think about making something positive? Uh, do, positive. Do you think about making something about the COVID nineteen, like a post or something, or do you think it would be in, inappropriate? I don't think it's for me. I don't think it's inappropriate. I think it's uh, something we're all going through right now. I think you know, just you need to make what you need to make to express the feelings you have and i think it's a lot of confusion i saw a great i saw a, someone made a vinyl toy a covid 19 vinyl toy and it was hyper cute uh -huh. it was really fun and weird and silly and you know um like all things if it's done in the right way um then then of course it's, it's up to you yeah i've never been one to do social commentary in any of my work really so i made a, a, a goddamn uh, anti-donald trump piece and instagram decided to tear my ass off so i was like i'm not i'm gonna stay the hell away from all that stuff so um you know yeah i'm not i'm not into really uh, a lot of the social commentary not in my work anyway um i try to i try to keep i try to keep it light you know i try to keep it pg <laughs> nice it's not the good news. yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just scrolling through to see if there's any more questions. Uh, oh, hey, here we go. Uh, Penelope, I believe you both collect vinyl toys. What are your favorite pieces you own? Oh, that's a Gav question. You lead that one off. Oh, um, oh, nice question, Pen. I think I love the artist Cause, K-A-W-S, and I've got a couple of his pieces, um, sort of a, 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 a dissected companion sitting down. It's about that big. And then I've got a, a standing dissected companion and just... I like, love the craftsmanship behind them and I love his work and I love uh, sort of how he's gone from a, a graffiti rat to king of street art and beyond. <laughs> so I'm a big I'm a big fan. So probably my cause pieces for sure. Nice. How are you, James? You're, surely yours is some of your collection behind you. Yeah, there's some of them back there. My, my main collection is down in a glass cabinet down in the living room and that's where all of my like wrestling figures are. And those are probably, they're not vinyl toys. They're not like collectible pieces or whatever, but my wrestling toys, the original ones that I have when I was a kid are probably my favorite. I got Randy the Macho Man Savage, Demolition, uh, Ultimate Warrior, that kind of stuff. But my number, one of my favorite very recent toys is uh, the Thrashor yes, figure. Thrashor, oh, you yeah. got one from 8-Bit Zombie, and uh, I ordered this a couple months ago, and it, uh, it arrived, and this one's one of my favorites, because it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not ever taking it out of the pack, but 8-Bit uh, Zombie does some goddamn good work, and I absolutely love the fact that he did a He-Man-inspired Thrashor, because I love that, all right, we're back, hey, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, so sorry about that, I think that that means we've lost the questions, we, because they have all gone, so that is probably, um, that is probably time for us to to wrap up, James, do you have any um, any final words? I mean, to, to, we want to we want to do this again, right? Um, hopefully, we'll do Absolutely. this next week. You know, if people enjoyed hanging out, we'd love to see you again. We'd love to have your questions, and we'll we'll probably pick another topic, and then yeah, see where that takes us. Maybe. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I mean, in terms of final words, like everybody, just be safe, be healthy. Um, you know. Please, uh, um, like I said earlier, link arms. We need community right now. And uh, everybody just, let's stick together. Let's weather the storm and, uh, and just keep supporting each other through this, uh, through this weirdness, you know? Uh, we all need each other. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, thank you so much for both of us for tuning in. We hope to do it again. We hope you've enjoyed tuning into Hustle Mania online. And stay safe, wash your hands, stay indoors, be good to each other, and we'll see right. you all soon. And we'll 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 check out the um uh the, the questions and we will notify the five lovely people who uh, are gonna get some codes for dreams. Shout out again to Sony Media Molecule. Absolutely. Right, love you guys. All Peace. right. Good day, everybody. Stay red. <laughs>